Welcome to the Centre for Optimism's Optimism Cafe, and today a masterclass of optimism, strategy and innovation, with a conversation led by Robert Hillard, Deloitte's Head of Strategy and Innovation. Joining him, Robert Masters, the Chairman of the Centre for Optimism, hosted by yours truly, Victor Purton, and a host of interesting people asking questions and making comments. Hi, it's Victor Burton, and this is our Optimism Cafe, and uh, we're delighted you could join us at lunchtime today. Um, Leading the conversation today are two people I admire immensely. Um, Every time I hear them speak, um, I feel inspiration. When I hear them speak on leadership, strategy, innovation, um, I always feel that I've been in a masterclass. So welcome, Rob Hillard. Thank you. Welcome, Rob Masters. Thank you, Victor. I think um, those of you who are attendees already know who these uh, people are. So Rob Hillard is the uh, Chief Strategy and Innovation Officer for Deloitte. Um, I've actually been in a strategy process with him for a corporate, um, and to see him lead an optimistic strategy process, um, it was just something fantastic. And we at the Centre for Optimism, we've done our first global study um, on optimism and strategy. Uh, 280 organisations, 400 professionals, um, 90% of them um, thought that strategy should be an optimistic process. Um, 60% thought they'd been in an optimistic process. And interestingly enough, only 20% of them had actually measured optimism. So that might be a question you hold for Rob later, Um, how do you measure it? So Rob Hillard, the first question we always ask in these optimism cafes is what makes you optimistic? Victor, thank you, thanks for those kind words. Well, first of all, uh, as as some of you heard me say as we were just warming up, uh, given that I live in Victoria and uh, Dan Andrews has just come on and said we can have five people uh, over to visit uh, from Wednesday, that's definitely given me room for optimism. Uh, the, but the, the serious side of that is actually, you know, once you, one of the effects of the whole pandemic experience has been to give you an appreciation for things that, uh, things that you don't, you know, when you don't have something, you suddenly appreciate it in whole, um, in whole different ways. Um, so, you know, certainly when we have the ability to have uh, some friends over, uh, the ability to appreciate them uh, is something that I'm greatly looking forward to. And I think, yeah, we will appreciate that. We know we will appreciate that far, yeah, far more. Um, I've been, if I, if I look at this year, I, yeah, it's been yeah, a phenomenally difficult start to 2020. It started off with the bushfires and then, you yeah, just rolled straight into the, into the pandemic. It has been, I have been really impressed by the human response of the vast, vast majority of of people. We saw Australians stand up when it came to a bushfire response. Um, And that still continued even through the pandemic. It's it's lower down in the media, but it's happening behind the the scenes and communities are really enthusiastic in, um, in, in being able to re, being able to rebuild, and then through COVID, it's yeah. If you go back uh, three months, how many people you know, actually understood transmission rates, or how to read logarithmic charts, or understood the importance of yeah you know, what a what what a coronavirus was, or what the vac- what what a vaccination might look like, and yet people have read and they've understood you know so much um, as a result of that, and taken responsibility uh, for themselves. Uh, that I, I I think that can only be a good thing on the uh, on the way out. What I hope is that we can harness. A whole lot of yeah. You know, while this has been a horrible event worldwide, yeah, you know, yeah. Let's harness the, uh, the those positive things that have come out. Yeah, Robert Masters talks about a better normal. That's right. Uh, I, I, well, I think that um, yeah. You know, one of the things that I, I've said when we get, when we talk a little bit about strategy, uh, one of the things that you, know, you always look at with every event is how much does this event fundamentally change society. And how much does it bring events that were happening anyway forward? Now, if you go through history, a whole lot of horrible crises have had the effect of accelerating other things around them. Most wars yeah, are catastrophically horrible events. 
But in terms of long-term social change, what they generally do is they accelerate social change that was, uh, you know, that was happening anyway. And by and large, the better part of, of humanity is what gets accelerated. So when we look at uh, what was, you know, where we were heading as a society towards 2030, there are a bunch of those trends that actually you know, come, for, come dramatically forwards as a, uh, you know, as a result of that. So we do see that there's, you know, that, that there's a whole bunch of optimism that you know, can you, you know, what benefits can we get out as a society of learning to do things uh, for 20, you know, 2030? I'll give you one example. We'll talk more about it from the strategy. But yeah, we, we were kind of lost on climate change. Uh, I think we, we, it, it became, it was the biggest topic you know, that was embracing all of humanity for, for 2019. Uh, now, it's, again, like bushfires, it's come down off the media radar because everything's swamped by COVID, but it hasn't gone away. But the language I'm hearing people think about and governments talk about is the idea of moving from just, I will keep everything the same and I'll respond to climate change, to one of saying, how can I build a sustainable economy, a sustainable uh, society and a sustainable ecology or environment? And that is a dramatically different, you've got, you've got a chance of tackling things if you tackle all three of those things at once, because we know sustainability goes hand in glove with environmental challenge. So, yeah, we've got a chance to invent things. And I think that will, that will be something that would have happened for 2030. We can accelerate right forward. And, and things like telehealth, you know, which for years nothing happened. All of a sudden it's done in threes. And perversely on health, um, you know, I'm getting feedback from mental health professionals that actually instead of spending two hours in a traffic ruminating about the things that are going wrong, having morning tea with the kids, lunch with the kids, um, mental health, you know, in, in a in a atmosphere of fear and anxiety, yet in fact, potentially, mental health is actually better. Um, I think there's, uh, and I think it's barbelled, unfortunately. Uh, we we know there's a lot of people who are really badly impacted by the um, uh, by isolation, and yeah, we know that there are some catastrophic mental health issues that are in the in the community, um, and domestic violence issues in the in the community. However our ability to be able to respond post pandemic is going to be substantially improved. So for years we've, we've known that we should have telehealth and, and we needed a Medicare item number for, uh, for telehealth. And there's been a whole lot of, yeah, you know, while it's broad agreement, there's been a whole lot of individual problems, frictions in the system, not least of which is that a lot of the people who need it most did not know how to use the technology effectively, including the doctors, the GP community, all of a sudden, yeah, we have moved the vast, vast majority of the world's population to be using, uh, yeah, to be to be using equipment like this. My mother, my 80-year-old mother, is using, uh, has finally learned how to, um, yeah, to do a video chat, uh, and and that it, it took the it takes the impetus. That means that she also sees, yeah, telehealth as something that she would uh, that she would use. And when you look at uh, the health dollar, where we, yeah, where uh, the percentage of budget. Um, of health was just growing unsustainably. Our ability to get efficiency out and then use that efficiency dividend to deliver better health outcomes is absolutely spectacular. So we can keep the GP in the loop on every referral, but we don't need to have a GP visit for every referral, which we know is expensive. Uh, yeah, we can get, for mental health, we can do so much this way um, and we can get the cost down and have it be far more responsive and again, fully paid for it. So it's a, I, I, it, it has a number of dividends we can, get, uh, we can get out. So I'd now like to throw to you, Rob Masters. You two are, if I may uh, use a pun, you two are masters of strategy and leadership. Rob, you're going to ask Rob some questions about strategy and leadership. Thank you, Victor. Um, Rob, just in listening to you, um, it becomes very, you, you've got a a great uh, degree of confidence in the community and the way the community has uh, addressed the how as far as use of technology is concerned, but also about how they've responded to it. So where do you see the leadership role in actually generating that, that how? I, I, it's, this is a challenging time to be a leader. Uh, and you know, one of the things that we're gonna see economically change is we're going into white water. Uh, we, we lack um, precedent for a lot of what we're dealing with day to day. 
uh, and we're going to be dealing with through 2021. Uh, the one of the phrases that I'm trying to encourage leaders to lose out of their lexicon is the idea of a no regrets move. You've probably heard that. It's it, it's one of those phrases that kind of corporate speak phrases that's built in. What are the no regrets moves? What decisions can I make as a leader that's not going to offend anyone, not going to get me into any trouble? Um, for leaders, uh, this is now a high risk but high reward um, game where you're actually forced to make decisions. and. Why do I say that makes me optimistic? Because I think that in a world where it was all growth, the economy was growing, 30 years of growth, you kind of, um, if you stuffed up by making a decision, you got, uh, you got punished because uh, if you had made no decision, growth was going to take care of it. In this environment, you have to make decisions and you have to take, uh, you can't, there is no, no regrets decision that you take. So that's going to force more decisive leadership. So decisive leadership is really important. And we know that, um, interesting enough, we've seen a flight back to the trusted institutions. So again, there's been a real loss of trust in leadership in all of its forms, uh, loss of trust in media, loss of trust in government, and loss of trust in business. Um, and survey after survey was showing, uh, was showing that. The response to the pandemic is that people are, have flowed, actually flocked back to those three institutions. Yeah, they may not, they may grumble about the government, but they are listening to the government. They're taking advice. Uh, yeah, they are certainly looking for the stability that business can provide and business being a really important part of the pandemic response and, 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 and close partnership. And trusted media sources have actually been drawn on more heavily than, um, uh, than, than pre, pre-pandemic. Um, so using that, from, and they're looking for leadership in all three where people are taking are actually taking a position and then communicating that position, and they're not expecting leaders to get it right every time. So humanity and leadership is really important, including admitting, you know, when we could have done, when we could have done it better. That that is coming through more and more, isn't it? Now this um, this humanity and leadership. Um, how would you uh, rate uh, both the political leadership and the business leadership? Uh, in this, um, um, how, how do you think that they are carrying the responsibilities well and enunciating the responsibilities well as far as the leadership is concerned? And how do you re- see that reflecting on trust? Um, imperfectly, uh, our leaders are not uh, our leaders are humans. Back to this human point, but incredibly well. Uh, you know, to, to have Australia form a national cabinet. Uh, you know, made up of uh, you know, four Labor, three Liberal. Um, you know, and the divisions we've seen, and we have seen divisions in our country, they have not been partisan d- divisions. They have been genuine arg- yeah, argument uh, divisions and uh, divisions of yeah, imperfect data, trying to make imperfect decisions quickly, knowing that time is a, uh, yeah, is a crucial element. I think it yeah, demonstrates the best of our leadership. Uh, when you look at the, the uh, business response, you know, it has by and large been save as many jobs as we can for as long as we can, uh, knowing that those are not, you know, that, that, that this is not, cannot be solved with, you know, there is cost to what's, uh, to what's happening. The pain is trying to be shared as, as effectively as possible and navigate incredibly difficult circumstance and being prepared to change decisions as they're, uh, yeah, as they may. I'm seeing that at a micro level in, um, in businesses, yeah, be it in, uh, yeah, be it in financial products as we've, as we've seen with, um, using very publicly with one entity, uh, be it in um, leave policies that people have, uh, that people have taken, be it in the way that pay is done. Yeah, people are making decisions uh, as with the best information they can and making it as decisively uh, yeah, as they can. And there's been a lot behind the scenes that um, of partnership with government seeking advice from business and uh, people freely putting you know, capability in and providing the best advice that they can. You, um, in one of your reports, I read that um, it was in relation to a crisis of confidence as far as leadership was concerned, but it, it also re- referred to the boards as well as the CEOs, etc. But one of the key things in there I found interesting was that. Um, uh, deciding today to uh, be resilient for tomorrow. And do you think that has uh, emerged from um, the, the virus and the, re- the um, responses that uh, both business leaders and uh, political leaders have done? 
Uh, I think that talking to a lot of boards, and I sit on two, I'm, I'm on the Deloitte Global Board, and I, um, I'm also uh, chair of the Australian Information Industry Association, and um, and talking to a lot of other board, a lot of boards in, um, in advisory role, one effect has been that, you, again, back to this, no, there is no no risk path. So far too much of our board governance has gone into this path of try and find the smallest risk that could blow up on you. Uh, and then, you know, again, we saw an extension of safe harbour going into the crisis. Uh, we have, uh, you've, you've seen it, you know, most boards have been advised uh, to be, uh, you know, much, have a much greater risk appetite for, um, you know, for decision making and to focus on trying to come out, uh, you know, this hibernation strategy, come out of this in the best possible state so that you can you know, rebuild and play your role in rebuilding um, in the back end of 2020 and into and, and through 2021. And I think that causes boards to think differently. The most common question I get is, yeah, you know, back to the strategic question, what changes versus what gets accelerated? And, and, and how does that change you know, how, you, uh, you know, how you think about your organisation going, uh, you know, going, you know, going out? Um, how do you think about hibernation? How do you reinvent your business uh, you know, on the back end? Because if something's accelerated, if that's in your products or services that were going to be most profitable, you've actually got the ability to bring profit forward in, um, yeah, in some way. Um, and that requires boards to be thinking, uh, yeah, with that optimistic strategy, Victor, uh, yeah, what, what products and services are likely to be valuable to my, uh, yeah, to my community, to my uh, to my customer base post uh, post pandemic. Well, how, how do you see? Also, you just mentioned that the optimistic strategy. How do you see that strategy working as far as the risks are concerned that uh, the organisations have identified? So what we did, um, I, I got a team looking at at this. Uh, we've got the one thing we don't lack is uh, lots of data. Uh, you know, there's there are reports. Everywhere and Doy is guilty of uh, producing uh, more than our fair share of them out there. Um, and there's a lot from a lot of economists, from a lot of strategists, from a, yeah. From, we try to look as much as we could. We said, well, what yeah? What are some of the common elements uh, to it? What are the things that are uh, not in that are not in conflict with uh, yeah with each other? Uh, and yeah, where, where there's where there's some convergence, and we did see some uh, yeah some common elements. I just, I, I, I just want to highlight six, and so I'll pull them up on uh, this uh, this screen over here, uh, because if I think that groups, whether they're boards or, or leadership teams, that focus on these six will be most successful. The first is that um, yeah that we've gone from that constant growth view of the world, where everything was uh, yeah long term. We encourage creativity, but it really wasn't core. We're going to an un a much more unpredictable environment. We're going to an environment where you need to have lateral thinking and creativity is at the core because you don't have data for a lot of what's, uh, for a lot of what's happening. The second is that, uh, with, is that trust thing I was talking about. So organisations need to bank on the trust view of the, uh, yeah, of, of the world, say, how can I get benefit from, how can I benefit my stakeholders by this newfound trust that the world has uh, for uh, me and what I uh, do. The third is fear of change. One of the effects of having s such a good standard of living and having security is that potentially you fear any change. We know that when people heard the word innovation, uh, a lot of people heard that as you're going to take my job away, you're going to reinvent my job it's going to, and it's going to go. In a world where my job's already at risk, Actually, innovation is no longer scary. It's potentially a way for me to protect my job and I'm willing to embrace it in uh, new, in new ways. So there's a partnership in change that didn't exist before. The fourth is really exciting for Australians. And that is we go from a world, despite all the technology we had, where every job had to be staffed by the best person available to work on site. Now suddenly, the whole world has learned to work virtually. So we can say, let's staff with the best person available from anywhere in the world. And remember, Australia should, if things go well, keep a low dollar for an extended period of time and has amongst the best professional workforces. Imagine that combination as an export capability. The fifth is uh, this idea, just back to the growth, 
we had fallen into the trap of growth as a goal in its own right. And too many strategies were geared around the idea that growth was the only thing that mattered. In a world where growth is not a given, you've got the potential to focus on what we call an advantage portfolio because you can be very successful with a much more diverse and agile portfolio. And then finally, that point about climate change, moving to this idea of sustainability across society, economy, and the environment. So sorry, long-winded answer, but, but those six we think are really important for the way that you, uh, you think about the post-pandemic world. It's, it's uh, very interesting you say that because in, in virtually all of them, there's an underlying current of optimism, but you don't see it coming to the fore in many of the strategies that even in um, the political realm, but also in the business realm, that, that sense of optimism is not brought forward to the way that um, St. Victor and I have often discussed where it should be. How, how do you see that? Do you think there will be a change as far as a greater focus on optimism uh, from all the elements of the strategy? I, I, I think that we have to make sure we value, properly value the things that we have. This is back to the gratitude piece. And um, it's also something like optimism that's underestimated. Um, and Victor, you've written about you know, the idea of what, what am I grateful for? Um, I think that applies corporately as much as it does uh, personally. Because we all think about, I wish my company had developed this. Yeah, you know, we knew five years ago we should develop, I wish I developed that. But think about what, yeah, you know, the idea of an advantage portfolio where you are looking at the granular levels and say, what, are, what is the best thing I've got? I'm not only going to be really grateful for it, but I'm going to really invest in it. It's, the, it's my point of differentiation. It's the thing I'm going to double down on. And, um, I am yet to come across an organisation when I you know, work with them where I don't find a hidden gem, something that, uh, that they've done that nobody else has done that they should they can absolutely double down on and make a, um, you know, make a point of differentiation. So that optimism and gratitude around that piece is, is really important because people are looking for leaders mm. to come out of this and say, this is the reason why we... You know, we'll get through this and why we will navigate because we will we, we yeah we will navigate our, our, our political leaders have have got us you know touch wood to here with incredibly low yeah, um, impact from this virus so if we can get through with our health which is really the thing that matters the most yeah. and of course business community we're going to get us through from a um, from an economic side and um, and the other thing I think there's a lot of fear in the economy at the moment because we see the giant numbers that uh, the that people are looking at from uh, from a stimulus perspective, and they assume that we have to pay it back. Um, and remember, yeah, the um, my colleague Chris Richardson has written extensively about your know, mining that you, you can either take an approach of you can try and shrink the budget to greatness, which is not a great approach, or you can say, um, actually, I will allow everything to grow, and effectively the cost of my yeah the the, the repayments go down as a um, as a result of that. A little bit like house prices, yeah. You, 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 if if your house values go up, then your um, then you are able to then your uh, your repayments become less and less significant um, over yeah, over time. So, Rob, yeah. can I just ask um, throw throw in something on on that front? So, your colleague Rob Hillard, Nikki Hutley, um, did a press club speech during the election campaign, and a male journalist got up and said, "Is there a difference between women and men economists?" And Nikki quickly just went straight back and said, no, in Australia, the division is between optimistic and pessimistic economists. And, you know, I've seen you leading a strategy, Rob, and it's optimistic and the scenarios are expressed optimistically. I've been in one in which the scenarios were led by your comp one of your competitors and every possible scenario was framed in the negative. So, so to the, Corporate people who are listening in and who will listen to this later, how do you find, you know, uh, what are the questions you should ask your potential strategy advisor to make sure they can lead an optimistic strategy process? Well, I think for both our politicians, whether a, strategy, a, a policy strategy or a corporate strategy, the same question comes back. You can cause short-term change by creating fear. Any leader knows that. That's how you, um, that's the best way. You go in front of the boards, and you want to get a budget, the best way to do it is to say the regulator is going to take away your license if you don't do it. You're going to get sued and you're all going to be uh, personally liable. And you'll get, you'll, get, you'll get budget to do something. 
but it's not going to create sustainable or, um, or economic return, um, and it's a bad place to lead a population. The right question to ask is, what is the opportunity? You know, what is the vision? Um, you know, what are the types of uh, what are the types of visions? Uh, and I think that that is the right way to you know the right way to, to couch. Yeah, you know, every scenario has a positive opportunity out to it. Can I find you know how do I how do I find that and how do I tell people about that part of the you know part uh, part of the problem? Even by the way, one where where, where potentially we're going to end up with um, less people uh, working in a particular area or less people um, um, or a shrinking market share. And I think the car industry is a good example of that. So when we framed the exit of the car industry and you know, we would, you know, no one likes the idea of, like the idea of manufacturing going away from Australia, um, but the assumption was that 200,000 people would never get jobs again. Um, in fact, that, and the problem with that framing was that it, that negative framing meant that a lot of people chose not to try. Yeah. And that act meant that there's a lot of people who end up taking early retirement who now regret that decision. The positive framing uh, meant that for the first time ever, uh, the government provided a tax break for training, which was not specifically for the job that you have or qualified for, so that people could invest in their future uh, outside of the industry, and the reemployment rate of um, of, uh, of car workers, auto workers, has been phenomenal. We did uh, I did a case study on it recently that um, really um, you, what you found was the important thing is not the age of the worker, but the freshness of the skills. And uh, described as being, you can be 23 again, that mythical age when you are at your most employable. Whether you're uh, yeah, 53 or 23, you can be that age again if you reinvest in the skills and we've got the recency to them. And some beautiful examples where people um, took, the, uh, you know, took their skills and applied them in a new way. And a long way to that, but, but just one more, one example, of that, one of my favourite, a company called Hickory Technologies, a brilliant uh, company in um, uh, Laverton, hired a bunch of auto workers. And so they looked at a highly competitive building industry, which you would say is naturally a, you know, competitive, so your share is potentially shrinking down. And uh, they asked a question, which was, what would it take to have zero defects in a room? Now, remember, this is an industry that says, by default, I don't know what the numbers are, 25 defects in a room is good. So other builders ask the question, say, well, like, if, I can get, if, if 25 is good, I'll get the defects down to 20 or 15 and I'll be world leading. What they said is, well, what would it take to be, who's got defects down to close to zero? And the answer is not in the building industry, it's in the auto industry. So they hired a whole bunch of auto workers and, um, and developed processes to build in their factory modular, uh, yeah, uh, modular components for buildings, which then get you towards that zero defect uh, target. And just a beautiful example of hiring people outside and doing things in a creative way, but required a very different positive frame uh, to think about their industry and also other workers. Well, we, we know that innovation has to be based on a foundation of optimism. So if we're looking at innovation and taking into account a few of the things you said there about Australia, Australians and how they've adapted, et cetera, where would you see Australia now in a, in a global position as far as business is concerned, innovation, and it's, it's really its leadership um, on the global stage as, from a political point of view? If you look at the things where we have been, where we have done well from an innovation perspective, particularly say in medical technology, biotech, um, that's been critical in our um, in our navigating this pandemic. And that um, that ability to adapt and pivot, you know, has has put us into a position where we are as well off as anybody in um, in navigating. We know that we have a strong innovation culture. What's important to remember is that uh, innovation has a process around it. And we've got a significant opportunity from an industry policy perspective uh, to actually coordinate and invest in areas where we are most likely to get a significant um, economy-wide return from innovation. I think that's a, a, a policy decision that we're really hoping um, government makes. Well, look, I wonder, Rod Wade, um, you've got a, a very interesting question on venture capital, and, and you've joined us from the United States. so. Please uh, make your comment and ask your question. Thank you, Victor. Um, it really had to do with what I perceive as a, a place in economics where there is optimism, and that's venture capital and angel investing. 
And while access to it is limited, I think I'm fortunate through an alumni group I have here from my university, I'm able to participate. But it's a great way to be engaged with up and coming companies. And I'm just curious about how you picture uh, any potential impact during and post pandemic to the VC and angel investing area. I think that, uh, great question. I think it's a fabulous question. And the, the, we need to make sure that um, that that optimism and willingness to invest is backed by some systemic support um, along the way. And the reason why it's important is that when you look at a long history in the Australian economy, that uh, big business provides strong balance sheets and an anchor for ecosystems, but small business with investment is where you create jobs the fastest. And we know that the government's priority is going to be what, what, what's going to create the largest number of jobs. So I think an alignment between VC and job creation is going to be you know, really, you know, really important. And then you go sort of how do you, uh, you know, how do you reduce some of the risks uh, in, um, you know, in that? And again, in our size of economy, that's where I think the industry policy is, uh, is important. And um, you know, we know when we do that well, we can do it. We, we can do it very well. Um, but again, just some stated, some stated support is going, to be, is going to be important. Thank you, Robert. Thanks, Rod. Teresa, you've got a really good question about opportunity in government and community. Yeah. So just following on, Robert, um, Hilliard, but, you know, you said that there's a lot of data and pointing to the way where there might be opportunities for new industries, new services, new activities. What, what are you seeing? What do you think there are those opportunities? Particularly, I'm thinking government, education and, and um, you know, in, in community sort of sectors. Well, first of all, I, I, you know, we talked about health before. So um, reinventing the health system is, has been a priority for some time, but it's actually now there's, there, there, there's a number of the foundations to be able to do that. And that's, um, I think there's going to be a willingness for health tech uh, to, you know, med tech to support that, that you know, has, has been there, but has had a lot of friction, a lot of obstacles to doing it, such as just getting technology into the GP uh, surgeries, uh, yeah, for example, uh, getting the fax machines out of the hospitals, which is still the last <laughs> place that actually buys fax machines genuinely uh, in Australia. Um, but education is another one. Again, you know, don't underestimate how much we've learned by, by moving all of our kids home uh, for a shorter or longer periods of time. We've suddenly realised that we can uh, that we can do teaching in a different way. And I've seen, as I've, I've got three kids and I, I, of three quite different ages and watching uh, from primary through to secondary and watching their schools learn. They're not going to go back to how they taught before. So the idea, the Eddie Wu model, where you have the world's best in something, providing key content and then coaching and support uh, through your school, I think is going to become really competitive and interesting. And I think those models around, uh, you know, models around that will, uh, you know, will, will evolve uh, you know, quite quickly. Um, I think that we've learned, our, our retailers have become, again, far more adept at digital, um, at digital services. And I think we're going to see that, again, uh, continue. And, and then there's going to be some models we can't even dream of right now, but they've kind of had the hints that tips, you know, bits of them have worked well. Uh, yeah, through the pandemic, and people are going to want to pick those up and run them. Uh, yeah, run them ongoing. So it'll be interesting to see again how that, uh, yeah, how that continues post uh, post pandemic. I can ask Sally Arnold to um, join us. Sally uh, represents some of the world's biggest media companies in Australia, and um, she's luckily on the beach at Surfers Paradise. So <laughs> Sally, join us. You picked the right place to be. Uh, yeah, to, to do your isolation. Oh, Robert, I have to say, this is the nirvana of, of the place to be in the world right now. I mean, even, even yesterday, it was ridiculous. I swam this morning. I swim every day, but it's, uh, you know, still 23 degrees in the water and, and the sun is shining. And my daughter, who is uh, still, you know, doing her online learning, um, is outside in the yard. She just doesn't want to be in the office. So she's outside, you know, on her uh, team's team as I'm directed it's not with an S uh, platform and uh, yeah chatting away so she works on three tech platforms happy as can be sitting in the sun but the biggest thing for her is of course missing her friends and uh, yeah and that that's that's the that's the big one so as much as we have all the tech we can't can't uh, miss that connection anyway I digress my my question um, I, and I love that you refer to the the move back for um, 
the trust to government, business and and the media. And the media playing, of course, a really important part as the communicator for much of the messaging that's gone out by government because they've relied on the media to actually go out there. And then people have gone, we need to know what it is, so where do we go? We go to those trusted, you know, mastheads that have been around for a couple of hundred years. And my question is, um, the FT have actually run a quite a big study, Financial Times, and I'm happy to share that with you. There is a point on optimism, Victor, and 48% uh, see that they're very optimistic about when they move through coronavirus. But how can businesses encourage trust and how do you measure that? Yeah, that's... So it's not, I, I don't think there's any one, uh, well, we know it's no one measure. If you simply say to people, do you trust, which is a you know, useful, uh, useful starting point, um, it's interesting but, but, but incomplete. Trust really means do you act upon? Uh, yeah, will you invest in and will you act upon what you, uh, you, know, you, know, what, what you hear? Um, if you're happy to sit and listen to, a, you know, listen to your leader um, you know, on, a, um, on a webinar, that's an interesting, you, you, you're demonstrating an investment of time. But if you don't act on any of the decisions, um, any of the recommendations, then you clearly don't have invested trust. And with the media, I think it's a, um, yeah, media at its best finds a very fine line between the, uh, the editorial and opinion and the, um, and, and the pure fact. And if people are willing to go to that for their level of, of action, then I think you know that, they, that they've gone there. And so really the question is, what decision did you make differently as a result of, what you, you know, of, of the source that you're engaging with? Um, Thank you. Bill Gormley, um, you're uh, joining us from Boston, I think, um, and you've got a question that's got a lot of support from other people like Guy Rousen and the like about new sorts of titles we're seeing. Yes, uh, can you hear me? Indeed. I think the, uh, uh, I'm working with a number of the different state governors in the United States and the immediate knee-jerk response of each of them during their daily briefings is to reach for their scientific officer or their medical officer. And it just seems to me that the natural follow-on that I wanted to ask you about is, isn't this really the way we should think about the board in the future and the operating committee of the company to have those scientific resources much closer at hand? It's, isn't it interesting? I think that, um when we are forced to have to make fact when we've got something like this we're forced to to uh to use experts uh you know actually reminded that that, our, that one of the most important things we need to do in all of our jobs is actually know how to use the experts really well and use them in the uh, use them in the right way but also maintain a, a healthy level of skepticism so if you look at so what, what's been interesting we've got our own set of um of health advisors and, and being in deloitte a privilege in that yeah they range from a former Surgeon General of the US through to someone who was the CEO of the TGA during the swine flu um, and, and, and a number in between but what I was reminded of was that doesn't abdicate my responsibilities or the responsibilities of my colleagues as leaders because what they're providing is the best fact-based information that they can provide but they can't provide the context of the leadership decision and what was scary, particularly earlier in this, when we first started navigating this, uh, I say, this first hit, I feel like I've been living this since January when a crisis was called of our board that our Chinese business was highly disrupted. Mm. Um, and yeah, then we went through, I, I chair um, uh, a global IT investment line and um, yeah, so we had to move in the end, more than 300,000 people into different working arrangements. and. Uh, we had all sorts of experts from health through to technical um, advising and telling us what could not couldn't be done. But the error bars and what they were telling us in uncertainty was quite wide. And that's where leadership context is, uh, you know, is, really, in, um, is really important. Um, and an optimism bias is important and a realistic optimistic bias. So I'll give you an example. Um, there was a strong view that it could be catastrophic if we moved um, initially uh, 50,000 plus of our people to work from home, particularly if we move our delivery centres uh, from home, which you just never do, because there's all sorts of security and other issues associated with that. The optimistic bias says, I don't know what the answer is, but I'm sure we will find it, and I've got confidence in the people around us to get there. 
the, the sensible part, the, 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 yeah, the, the, the informed part is to say, I, I, there's reasons why I know we've got those people and we'll throw everything at it and we'll make it happen. But if I allowed a negative bias to go in there and take the worst of the facts I was getting, then you'd simply just curl up in the fetal position and, um, and, and give up. Uh, or, or more to the point, we would have taken a more strong hibernate position for our business, which would result in losing a lot more jobs a lot earlier in the um, yeah, in the process. So experts, and we're all experts in our own domains, but experts close to us, but leadership not advocating from uh, actually putting that expert opinion into context, and then optimism in order to make sure that you're taking a positive bias in what you have, highly informed by what's available to you. Sue Barrett, I think you had uh, a question on opportunity. Uh, yes, I did. Hi, Robert. Um, I'm really thinking about local and world supply chains and also too, particularly how smaller business SMEs have often been seen as the weakest link in the supply chain. But particularly in Australia, um, there are great stories emerging about how local businesses have been able to supply things when large businesses who offshore their supply have actually been left wanting and don't have anything there. So I'm curious to know what you see in terms of innovations. Not, a, not an easy question, but what you see is innovations in the local and world supply chains that we're likely to see out of this crisis. Any ideas or thoughts? I, I think we've known for some time that our supply chains were too fragile. And um, I think one of the really important words for strategies in 2021 is resilience. And so building resilience in and multi-sourcing. I think, I think a, a risk that we must avoid at all costs is the end of globalization and huge barriers being put up between economies. That's a, a, that's, a, that's a risk that the pessimists will, uh, will, drive, us, uh, will drive us towards. Um, that, but that doesn't mean we should be afraid of local sourcing. Um, and the idea of saying that we let our supply chains get too long and we also allowed us to, too many of our industries to become dependent upon single points in that supply chain just says, well, that, that doesn't make good sense. And actually, you can end up with a better outcome if you can multi-source um, and if you can, um, if you can put capability. Again, I'll just draw on the car industry. The car industry knew for years that the best way of, um, of, of managing your supply chain was actually to export capability from your core company into your suppliers. I think you know, that's sort of what we'll, let, we'll end up doing more of. And hasn't been fantastic to see some of the invention um, and capability built, uh, yeah, within um, within small companies, um, yeah, and I think that'll I think they'll continue. And that's range from food, different approaches to food processing, uh, safety and food processing, through to PPE, and yeah, just you know less visible, but a lot of um, uh, but, but there's been a lot of supply activity just in you know quite specialised components uh, into things like the resources industry, which hadn't been available, you know, which had got cut off for other reasons. So, but if I could just say that from a from government sourcing and big company sourcing, it's about making sure that uh, they do open up the books to allow smaller businesses to be able to get a seat at the table and not be excluded because they're not global. I think yeah. this is, we've got to create more opportunity and be more optimistic about the quality and essence of good businesses locally and not just preclude them because they are not global. Because that's yeah. happened to many of us. Oh, no, you're actually, see, that's a really good point. And, and one of the things that one of the recommendations to government and big business is if you take that model of saying startups provide the innovations, by and large, they provide the, some of the greatest innovations. Small business, small and medium business provide the greatest jobs growth. And big business and government provides that procurement backbone, which enables that ecosystem to operate. Um, the, that big business and government procurement is not neutral to the success of the ecosystem. So this idea that you just buy lowest price, um, you, you're, we're too big. The, the, the big buyers are too big to simply be neutral in the marketplace. And so that's why I think deliberate sector, deliberate sector strategies, including, go, including large business in that, is, uh, is really important for our success. Um, April has a, a follow-up question uh, dealing directly with that supply chain question. April's in Denver. Hi, from Denver. Uh, yes. Um, do you find that the issue about supply chain has to do with too much governmental regulation that limits those others at a more local level? Because we're finding that in the United States, as an example, we're having a crisis in our meat industry. And so a local rancher, I'm in Colorado, um, cannot sell beef, as an example, right off of his ranch. He has to go through a meat packing plant to do so. 
Um, I think that uh, we wrote a report a number of years ago on um, red tape, and we called it getting out of your own way. And uh, what we were looking mm -hmm. at was the, the tie between regulation and why regulations were created. We are much better at creating regulation than we are at removing, and that's just a human nature because there's risk in removing regulation, and if you don't remember why it is. And I, I remember with a... Um, actually, I'll, I'll be neutral. I won't mention what it was, so it's, it's a, but there was a particular... Um, government regulator, who is a very good government regulator, um, and they probably know who I'm talking about, uh, but they, we were looking at the source of um, data they were, uh, that they were getting from the entities that they regulated, and we found that there was this particular piece of data that they collected that nobody knew why they collected it, and we went back and we actually found it had been started during the Second World War when there'd been a fear of invasion, and no one had thought to turn it off. Uh, yeah, afterwards. We, again, when, you know, when you look at, um, when you look at regulation, we need regulation is really important. It's important for safety. It's important for, uh, for to make markets operate properly. Um, but we, but we do, we underestimate the cost of regulation and that cost is in real financial terms during the good times, but it's in agil agility during the bad times. And um, understanding what the potential agility risk will be in a crisis like we're going through at the moment is something that has probably been underestimated in the way that we, uh, we, we allow regulations to build up. Um, Rob, um, I go back to the 1990s when there was a piece of legislation called the Bali Marketing Bill, which is particularly at the moment with the Chinese threatening sanctions on Australian Bali. Um, under that legislation, a Bali inspector had more powers than a, a federal policeman chasing heroin. <laughs> he could stop any vehicle, he could enter any house, not just to search for barley, but to search for documentation relating to barley. And when I raised it with the two ministers, because it was a South Australian Victorian joint scheme, they have never seen it. And um, it, it was removed that month, but it, it had lasted for decades. Now, um, Paul, Paul, I think you had um, yes. a couple of questions. Yes, thanks, thanks, Victor. I'm enjoying this panel very much. Um, on the optimistic perspective to do with polit the political leaders of this country, um, I was thrilled when we had the National Cabinet start. It showed that we have real leadership in this country. And every day, virtually, we see one of our leaders, usually a Premier, driving the, the agenda forward. And then ScoMo obviously comes on quite regularly. But I was disappointed that the Leader of the Opposition wasn't invited onto the National Cabinet. I know, sure, there were three or four um, Labor leaders in the Cabinet, but I really think that if, they, if we're going to have a good bipartisan approach to this, we should have seen the Leader of the Opposition on the, on the, on the Cabinet. Uh, who would like to respond to that, quick, that sort of observation? Thanks. I think we've got 12 minutes left, so I could ask the two Robs, and then I've got three more questions in line, and I think that will probably see us through. So, Rob and Rob, can I ask you both to answer that very interesting question from Paul? I think, I think it's a fascinating question. I think that you're um, one, of, one of the biggest questions any leader has um, is in a crisis. We know that move early, move hard is, uh, is important. By the way, that's not just true in pandemics. Uh, that's true when you are dealing with a, any crisis, a restructuring, yeah, any, any restructuring expert will tell you uh, that. Uh, yeah, that as well, even if you make mistakes along the way. Now, the challenge with that is how do you bring enough people along with you and get enough of a, um, enough of a coalition? And I think yeah, the example of you know, do you have the opposite view or the alternative uh, government engaged? Um, yeah, my default is, yeah, if you possibly can, you should. And, um, and yeah, the more voices you have in there, the better. But there is a trade-off. And uh, yeah, the further you go, the more likely you are to find a vision and then your, uh, your, your, your unity of decision-making breaks down. So I can see both sides of that argument. Yeah, I, I would agree with that, Rob. Um, uh, and Paul, I, I think politics is, is one thing that is always conscious as far as um, political leadership um, echelons is concerned and the, the, what's, what's driving the policies in that area. But within this particular pandemic, um, a number of Labor leaders or former leaders actually were behind the scenes in especially in the business and um, area industrial area uh, putting forward uh, ideas and um, and part of the think tank process so I think there was an engagement but as you as you say perception is a big thing 
and therefore it's exactly how far that uh, the Prime Minister's office allowed that perception equation to play out. Could I just I point one little, no. Could I just add one little point there? And uh, thanks, Robert. Um, and that is this: that with the pandemic, it's the issues are to do with everyone in the nation, not just one side of politics or another. And I believe that it would have been a good PR move to have had Albanese there because then his side of politics, the people who are adamantly supporting him and not the, the current government, would have maybe bought in more. And this comes down to especially the, the app that they're trying to promote. They're still not getting the 40% thereafter. Um, and I reckon there could be some resistance in the, in the populace very much because, hey, it seemed to be a, a liberal coalition sort of initiative. Um, but if, if Albanese had been part of that cabinet, um, there would have been a more balanced take-up. But I just I agree with the perception just, of that. Yes. Just, just on the app, I feel like I'd be um, remiss if I, uh, given I've done quite a bit of media on this. Um, I hope everybody on here has downloaded the app, please. Uh, the um, and the optimistic side of that is while there is uh, while there is fear and it is yeah it, it it it's an invasion of my privacy that in normal times I would never accept. I've got control over it. I can delete it at any time. Um, and the optimistic part of me says that I will trust the people who have created it. And by the way, it's trust and verified, but trust the people who have created it uh, with the goal that we've, we've got. So the optimistic, please, if you haven't downloaded, please do. For the Australians on the... Uh, totally on. agree. Oh, Victor, you're on mute. I get, I get overexcited when I have people I admire so much. Um, Lars, um, you've got a question on the people economy. Yeah, thanks very much, Victor. And I uh, couldn't help but smiling when uh, Rob spoke about regulation, because um, I come from a belief that people are actually the solution. Um, you know, if we can give them the space and flexibility and create the right work and work environments for that. My two big takeaways from COVID have been the first one is a return to connection and people realizing how important connection is. And Barack Obama said it really well this week when he said we're hurtling towards selfishness and self-interest. Uh, and the second big takeaway is that when people have been given the autonomy and trust to work from home, how they've actually showed up and they've actually delivered. And both of those are really powerful in terms of well-being, being social well-being and mental well-being. Um, my question is, what needs to change for leaders to value this when we go back to business as usual, as opposed to putting people back into their boxes? Because, Rob, as you said, you know, the agility risk in future is going to be a really important one. So what needs to change with leaders to continue to drive social well-being and, and autonomy? One of the most interesting responses to crisis, and I've seen this a number of times, um, is that at the end of the crisis, people will look at the decisions people were delegated with and will generally say that they got it, they got it right. And I'll, I'll give an example. I was talking to a large company that was involved in the uh, bushfire response. And during the crisis, they um, enabled people on their junior people or the people quite low, quite directly at the, at the front line to make quite large capital decisions on the spot, decisions that would normally require multiple levels of, um, of approval. And after the event, they then looked at the decisions and said, well, how many of those would our levels of approval um, cause, you know, said, no, that's not a good decision. And they basically said all of the decisions were good decisions. So, so you then go to um, one of the things that we need to do, whether it's empower and trust people in their um, work from home, empower and trust people in terms of rather than uh, rely on um, internal regulation as well as external regulation, empower and trust people to make the right decision, um, is can we, um, can we create more of a power and trust uh, culture in, um, in workforces in general? And I think every time we have a crisis, and this is such a good example, we need to do that debrief afterwards and say, what have we, what levels of, of control do we put in that actually we don't, um, we don't need? I think it's a really important question for everybody to ask themselves. Yeah. So Thank I've you. got um, Ben, uh, Noira and, and Sam. So Ben, I think you had a follow-up question from that on mental health. Yeah, I did. I did. Hi, everybody. Um, this is great. Thanks, Victor. Fantastic. Um, it was just a quick, quick shout and I'll just to see that um, you all um, have the support that you might need for mental health for yourself, for your loved ones, uh, workmates, anybody else you know. Uh, but there are a lot, of, lot out there, but just um, that you let everybody know that they are out there and they're loved and they're appreciated. So uh, uh, there, things do break down, things do break, and we just need to be aware of that. 
I, I think that's so important. I, again, just you know, the 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 sense that there we know that there are problems under the surface, and I think um, one of the things that we need to use the some of the efficiencies we've got of this technology is to make sure that we are maximising you know, uh, you know during and after the event, getting to the getting to everybody because you're right, then there's there's some tremendous resources uh, yeah, available. Um, what we have found is that generally the people who most need the resources are ones who are least and they feel least empowered to get them or least likely to know where to look. Um, and that's one thing that we all as leaders have to do. I, I, I think we just said was fantastic because in every forum, we need to keep on saying that because um, it's, it, you'll get one person unexpectedly. Yeah, we, um, Ben, we, as you know, we recently did one, an event with Dementia, or two events with Dementia Australia. Uh, we're going to be doing some work shortly with your, uh, with the Men National Mental Health Commission. So. The point you make is is absolutely spot on. I hope you'll be strongly involved. Um, we've got four minutes left, so Noren and then Sam. Hi, hi everyone. Lovely to hear from you, Robert and Robert and Victor and panel. <laughs> um, I have an optimistic question. Um, as this is the optimistic cafe. Um, it's to do with optimism and taking action. So this relates a little bit to me, but also now widely as well um, as a result of COVID. So I had to close my own business. I had an entertainment business. Uh, I also did some training and I did some, um, I did some team building and other things. And that's completely closed now because of COVID. Um, but the training arm, I had pivoted a little bit to the online world. And now that's where I am at the moment. So for me personally, I just, um, I took action where I could and it really made me feel quite positive and optimistic. I have now been exposed to a bigger world of, um, of people who have been completely displaced. It's called the Displaced Project, actually, and Victor's going to be a bit of a champion on this for me, which is amazing. And these are all these people from aviation, hospitality, tourism, and entertainment, all the foremost affected industries that have all basically lost their jobs, possibly won't be going back there in some cases, in a lot of cases, and are now looking to pivot from what they can do skill set wise from one industry to another. So, and this is actually done by people who are actually displaced themselves. So it's, for me, it's been quite amazing to see the optimism around the action that was taken by these people in the worst, worst times of their lives. And a lot of these people have never, ever, ever been unemployed. So um, anyway, optimism and action. Um, any, any points on that? It's interesting that um, it, incredibly easy to say and incredibly hard to do. Mm -hmm. The stats on um, when people have invested in training and the refreshing of their, um, of their employability is, are absolutely phenomenal. Even in, even in difficult times of past crisis season, we can go back, you know, in Australia, the last one we can go back to is the, full, you know, is the last proper recession of the early 1990s. Um, we know that there's a direct correlation between the ability to be to, to get quickly reemployed as a uh, as a result, um, but again, you know, actually the support services are what is really important in that uh, you know, yeah. through the journey because uh, people often don't know what are the skills that they that they should be investing in. They don't have the confidence that they could necessarily do that type of uh, the mm. type of that they end up actually doing, or they just don't know about what potentially is um, potentially is out there. Again, yeah, you know, people have a blinker to say I've always worked in this particular industry sector, and so they've not realised actually their skill could, their school could be morphed and be highly applicable somewhere else. I, I um, and I think that's going to be one of the most important things that we all do in the um, in the coming six uh, six months and beyond is basically making sure that people are refreshed and you know, going where the work, where the work is, because it will move. There will be movement of, um, of where the jobs are. Um, Sam um, comes back to that planetary question you raised right at the beginning, Rob. So Sam, what's your question? Okay, so my question is to you, Robert, is basically that there's a lot of people aware of climate talking about nature, but do you think there's actually been anyone really connecting the dots between the fact that COVID-19 or any pandemic coming out is due to the imbalance in uh, food and gas exchange with the climate? I mean, it, it actually comes down to microbes. And uh, although I would have thought the issue is wildly aware, but I still see people missing the what to me is very clear dot connection. And I was wondering at your level, what you see, how you see that when you say you're aware of that now? 
I think that uh, so I, the answer is I don't know, and 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 I'm not uh, not a I'm not an expert in the uh, in in virology or in um, in the origin of viruses or or what causes pandemics. I, I I do know that we've been talking about talking to the experts. There's been a growing awareness that there was kind of a virus like this coming for 20 years, and and obviously on the back of SARS and MERS. Um, so a sense of almost inevitability. The big question we've all got uh, is, but or two, there's two questions we've all got, which we just desperately want the experts to help us with. The first is, you know, if we come out of lockdown, how likely are we to get a second lockdown? You know, how likely are we to get re-emergence and what's the time frame? Is this a, uh, an annual event that we're going to have for the next five years? Is this something we're going to do? Like we need that, that, that really will affect, our, affect us. And then the second thing is, has something in the world changed that's going to mean that it's only a matter of years before we have another, um, an, yeah, another pandemic. So the question uh, is not a direct answer to, to, you know, to, your, to your question, but I'm certainly very keen that we know the answers and we, um, and we invest in the science to be able to find you know, what, you know, what was true to make this happen and what can we do to better protect ourselves as a, as a global society. Look, Rob and Rob, this has been extraordinary. I'm just uplifted and I, I'm, the messages we're getting, there are five other panels people want. And um, so you have just generated such wonderful feelings of optimism and joy in, in everyone who's joined us. And so I'm just utterly grateful. And to each of you who've joined us from all over the world as well. So. Um, Rob Hillitis, is there something you want to leave us with? What's uh, your no, my my father, since you and I met, I can't remember how long ago it was. Um, I've 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 all, yeah, you have you have meetings that with there are some meetings you see in your diary and go, oh, I've got to do it, I've got to do that. It's gonna be important, I'm gonna get something out of it, but yes, it, it, it's gonna suck the energy out of me. And then I see you in my diary and I know, no, nah, I'm gonna I'm I'm gonna get a lot out of this. I don't know what I'm gonna get. And it always ends up surprising me what I end up getting, but I always get something out of my meetings with you. So thank you. And thank you for organising these cafes. I think um, it's been more important than ever. Fantastic. And Rob Masters, can I ask you to, to thank Rob and conclude the event? Yes, thank you, Victor. And uh, to Rob in particular, um, thank you. Um, I think everyone has got a very good indication and excellent insights into particularly trust, uh, which you've highlighted. I think deciding today to be resilient tomorrow and most importantly, how optimism is starting to frame the, the, the so-called better norm as uh, Victor and I have discussed. But to everyone else who's participated, thank you. I hope you've got as much out of us as we have and I appreciate your, all your time in, in actually being part of this. So thank you very much. Thank you, Rob. Thank you. Well, we hope you enjoyed this. Centre for Optimism, Optimism Cafe with Rob Hillard and Rob Masters. We'd love you to get involved with the Centre for Optimism. Uh, the website is centreforoptimism.com. Uh, you can explore our, the publicly available materials, but we'd love you to join up and become a part of, of our community. Over 1,200 members from 39 countries. So go to the Join Us uh, tab at the top um, and join our community and be a, a part of fostering realistic and infectiously optimistic leadership around the world and in your own business, enterprise and household.